A driving force in the ride-sharing economy, Uber changed the face of transportation as we know it. Our expansion was crazy. 2013 and 14 is where every week we were launching a new market. It was Travis Kalanick who was really Uberizing the entire world. The founders of Uber have definitely completely transformed the landscape. I think it's pretty much transformed how we will travel from point to point uh, forever. But in the midst of one of the worst years in the company's history... Some people don't like to take responsibility for their they blame everything. People are questioning its culture, its soundness. They're questioning whether, in fact, they want to be associated with the company at all. Uber met its match in Southeast Asia. No one has heard about Grab. We, we, we did not exist five years ago. We take you inside Grab and Uber's head-to-head -head battle in the region. It's like having a, a fuse burning on both ends. That's a way to sort of burn up cash very quickly, which is what has happened for both the companies. When there are two firms competing, this is not going to last. This is the story of how a Southeast Asian startup took on an American Goliath and won. Jakarta, Indonesia. A boisterous, densely populated city of 10 million. Here, locals prefer to zip around on motorbikes. And green helmeted drivers from Grab and competitor Gojek are everywhere. But just a few months ago, this sea of green would have been peppered with Uber's black, white and orange. After years fighting out an expensive battle in Southeast Asia, Uber has conceded defeat and said goodbye to the region. Its assets, offices and drivers are now under the control of Grab. So what went wrong? How did Grab, the Malaysia-grown, Singapore-based startup, take down the biggest fish in the ride-hailing pond? It was our baby and losing that really hurt. Vidit Agrawal was Uber's first employee in Asia. When he joined in 2012, Uber was only three years old. A burgeoning tech startup run by Travis Kalanick with big dreams of changing the way people think about mobility. Then in 2012, when I decided to move and I was looking for a job, I looked at Travis's talk. I was completely impressed. The original idea was, let's go buy 10 S classes, let's hire 20 drivers, and let's get a parking garage. And I'm like, Garrett, we're not buying any cars, dude. And we're not signing any lease on a parking garage. Um, but the idea of pushing a button and getting a ride in within minutes was a magical one. The vision he had around building that business globally, he was solving a problem and the mission he was on, I was completely impressed. My goal was to that, that moment, I want to work for this guy. Uber first started out as Uber Cab, a black limousine service that could be ordered via text or by a quick tap of a button on your phone. It was developed by Garrett Camp, Oscar Salazar and Conrad Whelan, and 33-year-old Travis Kalanick served as chief incubator. It launched in 2010 in San Francisco and was an immediate hit, even though an Uber cost 1.5 times as much as a normal cab. When it first start to operate in the US is so successful is because the industry there was really ripe to be disrupted. Okay, the taxi companies there, there's tons of complaints of how expensive the taxis are, how difficult it is to get the taxis. And when, once you're outside the major US cities, like in the suburb or in the smaller towns, it's virtually impossible to find a, a, a cab or hear a cab from the streets. So when they had an alternative, that provided a very convenient um, way to get transportation. It was, it, was, it was great because not only was it really easy, it was enabled from the smartphone, but it also allowed them to sort of recognize which drivers were uh, good or bad and how they were rated, and they didn't need to carry cash. But then the fact that you, know, you, could, you, could, you could monitor where your driver was, um, uh, how far away he is, and how far your destination is, you know, that was a novelty. 
So Travis and Garrett have definitely completely transformed the, the landscape. I think it's their uh, entrepreneurship, their idea, their execution that has pretty much transformed how we will travel from point to point uh, forever. But Uber would only really take off from December that year when Kalanick replaced Ryan Graves as the CEO of the company. By 2011, Uber had expanded into New York and was valued at 60 million US dollars. Travis Kalanick was very much the leader and very much a public leader. He set the culture for the company. Everything stemmed from him. And everything we hear from you know, the inside just makes it very clear that he personified this idea of a disruptive, irreverent company that just wanted to, to break all the rules, shake them up, and do things very, very differently. Limited number of taxis, what does that mean? That means people wait in line, right? They're not getting around the city as they need to. It's fine to see the problem as an entrepreneur, but you also have to ultimately have a solution. A lot of great people who've changed the industry have been called Mavericks. I believe Travis is one of them. He's really passionate about the ideas he's building. He puts his heart and soul into it. And Travis is just a house on fire. It means one car serves 30 people instead of 30 cars serving 30 people. It means taking traffic like this, pollution like that, and turning it into something that looks more like this. It was probably that energy and that originality that, that led to Uber's very early and very rapid success. It was Travis Kalanick who, who was really Uberizing the entire world and getting people to think in a different way. Under Kalanick's leadership, Uber released the UberX service in 2012, which provided a less expensive hybrid car as an alternative to its black car service. In 2014, they released another cheaper service, Uber Pool, Uber's version of carpooling. Within three short years, Uber's value jumped from 60 million US dollars to a whopping 17 billion. Travis is always someone who's led from the front. He's an innovator, he's a coder in his previous role, so he really understands the product. He said that you don't want the industry to cannibalize you or uh, take over your market, you should cannibalize yourself. That is why when we had a limousine product, we launched UberX and we cannibalized our limousine product. Then UberX was doing well and it was the industry standard, we launched Uber Pool, which cannibalized at UberX. He was way ahead of his game. And that is how, you know, he's always led the market. Super duper Uber Pool. Backed by the likes of Google and Goldman Sachs, Kalanick started to look beyond the US to try and Uberize the world. The dream, one app, no matter where you are. Between 2011 and 2014, Uber expanded into 100 cities across North America, Europe, India, China, and Southeast Asia, including Singapore. Our expansion was crazy. 2013 and 14 is where every week we were launching a new market. Um, the way Travis thought about it was that transportation should be like running water. You know, you open a tap and there's always water. Similarly, you book a car and you should always get it. Or he always said that, you know, our passengers, our customers, wherever they are in the world, wherever, whichever airport they land, they should be able to press a button and get the car. They shouldn't be running around to get a taxi, trying to get local currency. That doesn't create a good experience. Travis was all about creating a good experience rather than just a ride. In Singapore, Vidit was part of a cluster of small, scrappy teams scattered across Asia, trying to seize new markets simultaneously, with the headquarters in San Francisco leading the charge. When I first joined, there was very little and limited understanding of the brand and the product in Southeast Asia, the whole of Asia, actually. Uh, you know, nobody had heard about the brand. When I told my parents I'm going to join Uber, they were like, you're going to become a taxi operator. Uh, we were in a small office. We probably had like three desks and that's all space we had. Very lean, three-member team that went around launching this business globally. That's how Uber started. It was very exciting. I had to do everything. I had to pay the rent. I had to buy office stuff. I was having the time of my life. You know, there was so much of learning. The curve was exponential growth. I was having a free MBA. Probably my first year of Uber was the best year at Uber. But Uber is a global app. 
Vidit realized early on that customization was necessary in order to crack these new markets. This the app is built and designed for a global product. But at the same time, you know, distant countries, there are requirements where you have to customize the product. In Singapore, where cars are too expensive for most, Uber started an affordable rental service called Lion City Rentals to encourage drivers to sign up. Likewise, in China, they partnered with Baidu for their maps because their Google Maps just didn't work in the country. My job often would start by educating them about Southeast Asia. We are 10 countries, not one country. You know, we have different language problems here. And then once that education happened, we worked around building a product there. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. Uber's aggressive expansion strategy of go in, think later, which worked in the US, was met with resistance in other parts of the world. Uber's strategy was not that different from other disruptors, was to sort of scale rapidly, try to get as many users and subscribers as you can. They didn't try to go to regulators and sort of tell them what they were going to do and try to get go through the whole bureaucratic process. Sort of don't worry about failing or making mistakes. Ask for forgiveness later. That worked pretty well in the US, but, but, when, but when they got to some certain markets, in Europe, France, Germany, and then also in, in Asia, they encountered a few difficulties. One is that the regulatory framework wasn't as kind. Two in here are doing nothing about it. Or welcoming. They probably learned all that as, after they got there. Absolute chaos here in central London. And to add another spanner to the works, Uber lost its monopoly as copycat apps cropped up everywhere and heated up competition in all of Uber's markets, Lyft and Gertz in the US, and Didi Chusing in China, to name a few. This ride-hailing industry has this tendency that they offer products that's very easily replicatable by its competitor. So at the end of the day, the right healing firms in the market, they offer very similar products, right? So when they offer similar products, consumers feel indifferent. No, they don't really have any brand loyalty. The door had been left open and the company that had built its reputation as disruptors would soon be faced with newer rivals, rivals who would go on to disrupt Uber's own success. In Malaysia, a tiny startup with big dreams would emerge. It's easy to lose a sense of connection living in a city. But when you bring people together, it starts to really feel like home. This isn't just an idea. It's happening on the ground and around the world every day. Within a few short years, Travis Kalanick's Uber grew from a fledgling startup in 2009 to a multi-billion dollar global unicorn with new offices opening every week in different parts of the world. The brand's disruptive image resonated with young people in particular, with its exciting new offerings like Uberpool, its carpooling service, and Uber Eats, its food delivery service. But Uber's rise has not been without controversy. And soon competitors emerged left and right, including a small Malaysian startup, MyTexi, better known today as Grab. A proud Asian enterprise, the company that first started out as a taxi hailing service has now carved out a niche for itself with a keen focus on local needs, cultures, and customs. It's Ramadan in Jakarta. As the city's predominantly Muslim population observe a month of fasting and increased religiosity, a small fleet of green-colored buses have appeared on the streets. So during the Ramadan month, we provide free shuttle services for the congregators. We call it the Jama'ah to leave the mosque after Traweh prayer. The buses that you just saw, they depart for a couple of residential districts outskirts of Jakarta. This is Grab Bus. Grab's experimental free shuttle service in Jakarta that transports people to and from two of the city's largest mosques for Tarawih, or evening Ramadan prayers. Yeah, we're partnering with one of the most prominent bus operators in Indonesia. People can do advance booking up to seven days ahead. For women congregants like Ibu Eni, Grab Bus is a welcome solution. 
Last year, she would have had to take the bus and then change onto a train to get to the mosque. Grab Bus picks her up from her home and brings her directly and safely to her destination. Aman ya, aman di jalan kan sampai ke tujuan. Kalau kita sebelumnya kan turun naik. Pelayanan ini cukup membantu karena kita yang uh, ibu-ibu perempuan sampai rumahnya malam jadi benar-benar membantu. Grab Bus is the startup's latest offering in Indonesia and yet another example of Grab's hyper-local approach. It's been the cornerstone of Grab's philosophy since it was founded in 2012 by Anthony Tan and Tan Hueling. All hyper-local is is actually about listening to customers and solving what their needs are in a segmented way. And considering the diversity in Southeast Asia, how Singapore is so different from Indonesia, how Indonesia is so different from the Philippines and Philippines from Thailand and Vietnam. And whichever country you go to, there are similarities, but there are also differences. Grab Bus responds to a very specific need during Ramadan in Jakarta, where roads are constantly gridlocked and only one in five people make use of public transportation. Uh, basically, there is less supplies on the road, particularly at the latter stage of the day during Ramadan. This combined with an increase in demand at mosques creates an undersupply problem, which leads to our passengers not getting the fleets as easy as during the normal days. We want to create a platform that will facilitate mass adoption of public transport by providing comfortability and safe, safe commute. Grab first began in Malaysia as MyTaxi, a humble taxi hailing startup with grand ambitions to provide safe, secure and convenient taxi services to Malaysia and the rest of Southeast Asia. It was actually a very personal problem for me. Um, back in Malaysia back then, uh, you couldn't really take a taxi ride without feeling unsafe. It was actually a constant challenge trying to convince my parents to allow me to take a taxi ride because they were constantly concerned that I would actually be robbed, potentially raped. Um, and it just wasn't a fun experience to be in. Because of certain bad apples in, in the system, the entire industry got a tremendously bad reputation. So we were trying to solve this from a holistic perspective. We we're trying to help drivers earn you know, more income in a more respectful way. And we we're trying to help passengers get more safe, efficient rides with the drivers that they thought were safe and good. That was where it started. My Taxi had 11,000 downloads on the first day. And at the time, Uber wasn't yet a threat. Grab's only competitor was Easy Taxi, another taxi booking app. But Grab pushed ahead of its competition, and it was down to one thing, trust. So back here is where uh, we train our drivers um, on safety driving, on how to use the app, uh, on customer service. So when we first started um, operations in Singapore, uh, the driver centre at that time literally consisted of a table, like a desk, right? Uh, and today, we have this space and we are able to onboard and serve up to a, a thousand drivers every day. When Grab first expanded into Singapore in 2013, KLJ had a formidable task, similar to my taxi's first days, Recruit drivers one pitch at a time. You have to remember at that time, no one has heard about Grab, right? We, we, we did not exist um, five years ago. And so, the first, one of the first things we had to do was to get um, our primary customers, in this case, the driver partners, to try us. So then we think, you know, where do, where do they hang out, right? Um, so there's two, two main areas. One is the hawker centres, and one's the airport, right? When you go to the airport, you see a long, uh, long line of drivers. What we would do is we would jump into one of the taxis at the back of the queue and normally we work in pairs. Um, one, one of us would be pitching to, to the driver like what, what is crap about and the other guy would be like taking down all his details and basically signing, signing him up. Like. At the end of five minutes he would reach the front of the line. Right? Um, so we had five minutes to close in and then once we have done it we get out and we go back to the queue and we start again. It was hard work um, but very, you know, again, very humbling um, and also, you know, very, when you look back, very fond memories. A 
And once they were on board, the small grab team had to make sure their drivers were supported round the clock. You know, in the early days, we did not have much budget, right? So what that means is we, there was no big marketing, there was no big advertising. Um, we relied heavily on word of mouth. And I remember the times where I get calls at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, you know, I, I am very grateful that you know, my, my wife put up with it. But we, we had to, we had to earn that trust. Jimmy has been a taxi driver for 20 years and was Grab's first recruit. He recalls how important word of mouth was in convincing his peers to join Grab. In fact, uh, it's not easy to coax uh, the other, other many drivers to, uh, to, to sign up because it's, it's something new. A lot of drivers haven't heard of this before. There must be somebody who have already signed up, right? Like me, and then uh, have good experience on that. And then we market it to our, I mean, to our taxi, just taxi driver friends and say, hey, this is helpful. In under three years, Grab expanded in 21 cities across Southeast Asia. It joined the Billion Dollar Unicorn Club in 2014. And by 2016, Grab had become a major competitor to Uber, also offering its own private car and carpooling services, Grab Car and Grab Share. Drivers for Grab and Uber would share a percentage of the revenue earned from their rides with the companies. Both firms also offered incentives for drivers to sign up and provided discounts to consumers to increase their use of the app. And while Uber concentrated on seizing markets with a one-size-fits-all app, Grab focused on their hyper-local approach, offering services specific to each locale. Having a local understanding of the market cannot be underestimated. Every city is different. Even within the same country, like in Vietnam, for example, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh, they're so different. They speak different languages. The weather is different. Um, the behavior of commuters are different, or customers are different. Um, so, you need to understand all those nuances um, in order to be able to um, serve our customers, your customers better. But there is one thing a lot of Southeast Asian cities have in common. Monstrous traffic jams, like this one in Jakarta. And so, for the most congested cities in Thailand, Vietnam and Indonesia, Grab released Grab Bike, motorcycle taxis that can easily weave in and out of the traffic. While Uber cars were stuck in traffic, Grab easily cruised ahead in the market with their bikes. Uber eventually catches on, but only 17 months later and 17 months too late. One of the advantages of Uber was that they have a single app installed in your phone, and when you go to foreign countries, you open the same app, then you can uh, enjoy the ride-hailing um, uh, services in that foreign country that you travel to. So this is definitely an advantage. Um, on the other hand, this also comes with a cost, that if you want to change any functionality of that app to cater for the local needs, you will have to change it altogether. This involves quite complicated um, IT um, changes happened in the headquarters level. So suppose that you know in Africa, people want one function, in Europe, people want another function, and in Southeast Asia, people want the third function. Right? So Uber will have to find a way to prioritize or build all, the, all of them in. And this increases the reaction time, of how they can customize their service to meet the local demand. And there was another problem that Uber didn't respond to quickly enough, cash payments. The one thing that differentiates you know, Asia, or Southeast Asia in particular, from maybe the maybe the Western world is that uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very cash-based economy. Um, so we started out with cash, and that helped us tremendously um, in competing with you know, the other players. Uber continued to only accept credit cards for two years in some parts of Southeast Asia before finally introducing cash payments, and it cost them. Meanwhile, Grab introduced Grab Pay, an in-app e-wallet that could be used to pay for rides and could also be topped up at convenience stores and petrol stations. 
Grab not only solved the problem that people couldn't really pay for their rice, they also had the opportunity of venturing into other areas. So once you have these payment methods, you can think about you know, building this one into an e-commerce platform. You can start to sell other products. This e-wallet could not only pay for the, uh, for the rice, it could also be uh, used in the restaurants, in convenience stores, etc., etc. So I think this is a very smart move. Was Uber stretched too thin, that they were always two steps behind when it came to localizing their app? I think it goes back to what we care about. Um, we hired a lot of local talent. Um, we also cared a lot about developing the best local solutions. And I think that hyper-local approach was, was something that was important. Um, that, again, you know, global companies sometimes take for granted. Yes, Uber was an American company, but to be frank, I don't really believe in this local versus foreigner, but it's a great PR story. You know, at Uber, we would always hire local people. Our Vietnam GM was Vietnamese. Our Philippines GM was Filipino. You know, product was designed for the global market for 1,000 cities. So Uber was always trying to localize, right? So we tried our best. But if you were to compare with the local competitor, which is Grab and Gojek, they were 24 by 7 focused on the regional markets. They had people on the ground. They had engineering team on the ground. And their decision making could have been a lot faster than ours just because of the distance. Despite its best efforts, Uber was falling behind in foreign markets. And as 2017 approached, the company faced far more worrying issues. Some people don't like to take responsibility for I their own they blame everything but in why their life on somebody the email else. For tone card. Good luck. Since it entered the Southeast Asian market in 2012, Grab has given Uber a run for its money. Its savvy, local-focused strategy is winning markets all over Southeast Asia, with an app boasting features and services tailored to the local population. And an out-of-touch Uber was failing to keep up. And there were greater woes to come. Uber's no stranger to controversy. Since it first disrupted the transportation industry in 2009, the company's been dogged with scandals. Taxi companies worldwide have protested its presence in their cities. They're offering nothing. Well, they're being bankrolled to put everyone else out of business, and when they put everyone else out of business, you have left with a monopoly. It's been banned in Delhi after a woman was raped by one of its drivers, to name a few. Then came 2017. 2017 was a very tough year for Uber. It's another PR crisis. Lots of such PR crisis. It really damaged the, the company's public image. January the 27th, Donald Trump enforces the refugee ban. This is the protection of the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. Outraged citizens protest at JFK Airport in New York with taxi companies joining the strike in solidarity, refusing to pick up any passengers. But Uber chose to continue operating and profiting from the strike, a politically laden decision that sparked the viral delete Uber hashtag campaign. March the 3rd, the New York Times revealed that Uber had been using a tool called Grayball, which used data collected from Uber app to make it impossible for certain individuals to use Uber, including law enforcement officers. Here's how it worked. A city inspector who launched the app to hail an Uber X car would get an altered display showing no cars available or the ride would be canceled. At the same time, Bloomberg released an explosive video of Travis Kalanick berating an Uber driver, which quickly went viral. When I saw Travis Kalanick losing it with an Uber driver and being filmed and that being distributed on social media, my instant thought was, here we go again. Business. What? What? You dropped the prices on, on black. Yes, you did. Well, we started with $20. Well, started with $20. You know How much is the mile now? 275? You know what? What? Some people don't like to take responsibility for I their responsibility. They blame everything but in why their life on somebody else. you email for town card? Good luck. Good luck to you too, but I know you don't gonna go far. 
is another situation where a CEO has failed to appreciate that when a company is under so much scrutiny, they need to be conscious of their every single move, every word they utter, because they personally could be the catalyst for a global crisis if they get it wrong. And Travis Kalanick probably hadn't thought about that, but I bet he thought about it afterwards. These came just days after former Uber engineer Susan Fowler had published a blog post in which she accused Uber of fostering a misogynistic corporate culture. It achieved a huge amount of, of publicity and stimulated a very important debate. It was very early on in a movement that is questioning the behavior when it comes to, to sexual harassment in all sorts of different industries and companies. Uber was at the sort of sharp end of that. Thrown into the public eye, Uber opened internal investigations. A string of messages over company chat. It was clear he was trying to get me to have sex with him. Fowler says she immediately... Internal memos revealed that sexist attitudes came from the top down, including from Kalanick himself. Uber was slapped with 47 recommendations and over 20 staff members were fired. Well, 2017 was a terrible year for Uber. There were issues around political alignment, around the way that they behaved with profiteering, around sexual harassment, around the conduct of the CEO himself. All of these at the same time. But when you're hit by all of these in that short period of just a few months, unless you do something very, very drastic, there's always going to be a danger that what people are questioning is not the individual incident, but they're questioning the company as a whole. They're questioning its culture, its soundness. They're questioning whether, in fact, they want to be associated with the company at all. When it comes to women, Uber's reputation has never been stellar. While there are no global statistics, in the US alone, as of 2018, 103 Uber drivers have been accused of sexual assault or abuse. The, the, the quality of drivers differs a lot. Some drivers are very good, some drivers are not so good because they, they did not have the rigorous screening process in recruiting drivers. With safety concerns like these in mind, Grab has asserted its commitment to securing the welfare of its passengers. Safety is paramount, so we give our best for this, not only in terms of process, making sure that um, our drivers are um, well checked before they um, um, onboard into our system, but also in terms of um, technology that we provide. Since the beginning, when we launch our service, we are the only ride hailing that provide a feature that called Share My Ride. So our passengers can always share the rides with the loved ones, making sure they can track where the whereabouts of the passengers. Aside from its emphasis on safety, Grab also had the advantage over Uber when it came to staying out of trouble. When you look at Grab's reputation, it's interesting. They were seen as, as friendlier as in some way more in tune with the needs of their customers. Faced with a choice of going with the company that you've been hearing about in the news as, as having serious difficulties with sexual harassment and a pretend, potentially broken culture, are you going to pick that company? Or are you going to pick the company around whom there's no bad news? I think most people, whether consciously or not, would go for the company that does not have a reputational problem. Meanwhile, Uber was spending all their resources putting out fires in the US, their home base, leaving other markets vulnerable. There was so much of negativity which we were trying to recover from. Yes, it did affect the focus. And it also gave an opportunity to our competitors, Ola in India, to grab, to catch up. They were not leading the market, but they could easily you know, focus on these markets. They doubled down on their initiatives and they, they led a lot of the markets. And after unsuccessfully trying to restore their shattered reputation, Kalanick eventually stepped down as CEO. One thing you have to do is do something big and something drastic, not just to speak to change, but to signify change. Your actions have to back up your words. And many would argue that it took four months for Travis Kalanick to step away, that that was four months too long. Travis Kalanick is you know, uh, has done a great service by 
his contributions uh, with Uber. So I think I have, I have respect for him in terms of a, an entrepreneur. Um, you know, and I think uh, the world will remember him for that. Uh, but and also, you know, he's, um, his, he, he's a good example of somebody who was, you know, very good at startup phase, but perhaps not the right person for the company as it scaled up. With Kalanick finally out of the picture, Uber appointed a new CEO in 2017, Dara Khosrowshahi. Moving forward, it's time to move in a new direction. This begins with new leadership and a new culture. Promising a more transparent, responsible age for the company, Khosrowshahi's appointments looked to be a step in the right direction for Uber. But the ball was already rolling on Uber's decline, with the company set to lose its hold on a major market. The company that first paved the way in ride-sharing transportation was now under threat from all sides. While Uber was busy dealing with its scandals in the US, they were also fighting a battle on another front, winning Southeast Asia. In 2017, Uber and its regional competitor Grab launched a vicious price war. Both sides competed to offer the most tempting discounts and incentives with hopes of enticing a larger user base. The end goal? Presumably for one app to force the other out of the market completely. What you can do to attract consumers is to fight a price war. And to do that, you definitely need to run losses and you can't really make a profit out of a price war. And that means, you know, when there are two firms competing, this is not going to last. When, when we think about the battle between Grab and Uber that's happened over the last few years, it has been a battle for the consumer. So obviously, um, price tit for tat. Both have to offer pretty attractive discounts. It's like having, you know, it's like having a, a fuse burning on both ends. And, and that's a way to sort of burn up cash very quickly, which is what has happened for both the companies. So the price war started with the goal of capturing the market. You know, uh, when you enter a market, one is promoting your product, but the best way is to give riders discounts to ride so that they continue riding and give a lot of incentives to the driver so that they continue driving on your platform, which gives you a bigger, bigger market share. I believe over a period of time, it created various problems. Any week we would spend, we would get the revenue and the week we're not spending and doing the incentives, we're not making money. Also, we created a world where there was very little loyalty, both from rider and drivers, and both would have, the riders and drivers would have the Uber and Grab app open, and whichever was cheaper, and where the driver would make more money, they would take that ride, right? So it created an unsustainable fabricated economics for the business which just couldn't exist. Uber had been in the same untenable position before. Back in 2014, having raised 1.2 billion US dollars in funding, a confident and capital flushed Uber thought they were equipped to take on the world's biggest market. It is a uniquely Chinese thing to invest as deeply as companies invest here before they get to profitability. In order to serve the entire population here, uh, you, really have to be, you really have to be ready to invest. And I think uh, Uber has shown that we are and that we're, we're here for the long run. When Travis entered China, um, he said, that within one month, I'm going to defeat DD. <laughs> it's, you know, but we know after one year, it was not able to do so. Uber had taken its one-size-fits-all tactics to China, but the company would soon learn that the Chinese market was unlike any other. And it was not to be underestimated. Whenever a foreign company enters the China market, you just cannot simply copy what you did in your home country to the Chinese market. You must localize your products, your service, your management style, your relationship with the public, uh, with the government, with the public, with the media. All these are very, very important for being successful in the Chinese market. And they were facing a well-funded competitor who knew the market much better. In Asia, they encountered uh, lots of competition from companies that were pretty well uh, funded. So in China, they encountered Didi, which was you know, backed by Alibaba and uh, you know, Tencent. 
with deep pockets. You know, we invest a lot of money here in China to grow our business, and we have a competitor who's investing even more. And Didi could concentrate all its resources in the Chinese market to, to compete with Uber, but Uber cannot concentrate all its resources in the Chinese market just because Uber had so many market, so many markets to take care of. With billions of dollars lost and victory still beyond reach, Uber could no longer hold out. Not far away, news of Uber's departure from China galvanized its Southeast Asian competitors. It probably started back in 2016 when, when the news of Didi had acquired uh, Uber's operations in, in, in China. And that's when we started thinking, hey, you know, um, a homegrown local company is able to overcome a global giant. And that, that's when the belief started. A hard-fought acquisition victory for Grab came through in March 2018. And with it, Grab ceded to Uber a 27.5% stake in the company. I would rate Grab as the second most aggressive competitor after the DQID. And till 2016, both the companies were at neck to neck when it came to market share. But to the, in 2017, because of all the international PR issues Uber faced, you know, Grab, kudos to them, they took the opportunity and they grabbed the opportunity in full hands and they took over the market. Our strength was being a global company and our strength was being across the world. Uh, but we could have done a better job at being more local. Um, a lot of our faces in the company were not that local and that was often pointed out. Uh, our marketing could have been more grounded and more local. So yes, there were mistakes learned and lessons learned. I don't really think it was a failure. <laughs> I, I think it was, you know, if you think about it, it was just sort of trimming their portfolio, you know, and focusing on the countries that they need to do now much more um, you know, in a committed way, rather than trying to fight a battle on so many fronts. So, in some ways, it was a, it's a smart move on the part of Uber. And then it, it, it's actually even good because they get a stake in Grab, which is now, you know, has a high valuation. When we first started this journey together, and when we first heard about Uber entering the markets, to be frank and honest, it was um, a bit scary initially, right? Because at that point in time, there was this big global behemoth with, you know, multi-billion dollar valuation, lots of engineers. And we were a small startup from Southeast Asia with big dreams, but very different starting points as well. So when the deal closed and throughout all the years of hard work that we put in to develop better services, develop better team, develop better solutions. Um, it was a big milestone for us because it was reinforcement that we were doing the right things and that the crazy journey that we had started was worth it. Now a long way from its humble beginnings, Grab has granted us access to its sprawling Singapore headquarters. Pay oversees the internal engagement of employees, better known here as grabbers. We are actually at the pantry area. This open space allows us to really just come together, do a quick uh, update. It's not very formal, it doesn't uh, restrict people. Yeah, and this is also a space whereby you can come and meet new people because as the company grows a little bit bigger, it's important that our grabbers know one another better. Yeah, as we grow bigger, we have to become smaller as well. The connections are important to us. While Grab is now a household name in Southeast Asia, the company's long-term profitability, like that of its peers, Uber and Didi, remains in question. A lot of people are asking, will ride-hailing business ever make money? If you take other disruptive companies like Amazon, you know, they also lost money for a long time, but then eventually they, they did start turning positive profits. But Uber has not turned positive profits, neither has Grab. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I don't think uh, most DD has either. The, the biggest challenge, and they are still facing, is how to turn this one into a profitable kind of business. So that, you know, because all the investors betting their money on you is because they, they, they trust that at one point you're going to turn this one into a profitable industry. So how you're going to achieve that, we still have to wait and see. The path to making money 
And returning to profitability comes when there's some stability and lack of tit for tat. And, and then you can build some order and structure and into pricing and, and, and how you recover back. So that's why I think it's good that, you know, hopefully we are past the, the bloodbath and hopefully can recover to profitability. I mean, for, for all the right hailing players, actually, not just Grab. Soon, you'll be able to wake up, get ready, and leave your wallet at home. Grab has since outlined its vision to expand far beyond ride hailing and even beyond the current adoption of its mobile payment arm, Grab Pay. It now seeks to make the Grab app an everyday app, handling virtually every aspect of day to day transport and payment, from taking the public train in the morning to ordering takeaway dinner that night. Grab has evolved significantly beyond just a transportation service. Uh, we've become an ecosystem and a platform for many different customer segments uh, to be part of. We now have merchants, we now have agents, in addition to the original passengers and drivers we've been serving. In the future, Grab will have to anticipate the arrival of competitors to its shores, this time trying to fight out Grab as the incumbent. Gojek, a hugely popular app in Indonesia, recently announced plans to expand into Southeast Asia. Newer startups have already begun to test the waters against Grab, like Ride in Singapore and MyCar in Malaysia. For now, Grab can enjoy being the victors of a David and Goliath battle, whose outcome few would have predicted just five years ago. We don't take that good fortune lightly. We take it as a very significant responsibility because we're, we've been fortunate enough to, to be able to do what we get to do now with so many amazing people. I think Grab, being a local company here, it really does a very good job um, in terms of catching up, catching up with Uber, how it successfully operated here, and especially how it succeeded in uh, localization and cater for the local demand, understanding the local market and design products to fit the local demand, um, you have to give them the credits.